What book are we in? Galatians. We're going to stay in Galatians till y'all remember we're in Galatians. <laughs> no, that's not true. Y'all go ahead and smile. It's okay. It's not all bad today. Amen. You're going to have to perk up a little bit now uh, this morning. We, uh, we talked last week about uh, who's your mama. And uh, so uh, we're going to continue that this morning. And just quickly, I want to just do a, a rundown about what happened, I, uh, what led up to this point of this part of this letter in Galatians. And we're in chapter 4, verse 21 is where we'll start. But remember that uh, our passage today talks about two mothers. And uh, the, the, we changed that who's your daddy to who's your mama because... Uh, what Paul had done is he had taken the ideal of these Jewish teachers who were false prophets, uh, and he poked at their, uh, kind of sarcastically, at, at who was their mother, because uh, he reminded them that Abraham had two wives, Sarah and Hagar. One was an Egyptian slave, and we talked about all this last week. Uh, Ishmael and Isaac was... Uh, was Abraham's two sons that he had. In Galatians 4, starting in verse 21, he asked us this question, Tell me, do you want to be under the law? So for you this morning, tell me, do you want to be under the law? Let's try that again. If you, if you do, say yes, but do you want to be under the law? No, we, we don't want to be under the law, folks. The reason being is the law, it says in the Old Testament, reveals our sin to us. That's all it does. It just shows us that we've sinned. And the law shows us that we can never meet God's standard. So if we would say, I'm under the law, then we would say, you know, I'll, I'll never meet God's standard. Because Paul goes on, he says, Are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, Hagar, and the other by a free woman, Sarah. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. See how Paul is already starting to, to shape this ideal of if you have one there who's a slave who's born in an ordinary way, but you have one who was a promised son who was born supernaturally. These things may be taken figuratively, for the women re represents two different covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai, which is the law, and it bears children who are slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem, well, because she is in slavery with her children, but Jerusalem that is above is free. She's our mother, for it is written, Be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud. You have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than her of, her, of who has a husband. Now you brothers, like as Isaac, are children of a promise. At that time, the son was born in an ordinary and uh, way uh, pursued by... Y'all help me there. Uh, persecuted by the Son born of the Holy Spirit uh, is the same now. But what does the Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, are we not children? Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman but the free woman. Boy, get all that out and you've done good. Maybe y'all ought to be leading this this morning, but, uh, but I want you to think about what Paul is saying. And we've already talked about all this, and I, I thought it was really interesting. I told somebody last week, we were talking about this, and I said, you know, I've, I've enjoyed my study here because I've learned so much about the law and about grace, and I would, I would always say that I'm under grace, but as we start... Uh, peeling back different layers, I think we find little pockets of the law still hanging around in us. And we, we don't, maybe we don't always realize that. But we talked about Sarah and Hagar. We talked about the, 
the, the promise that was, uh, that was given to Sarah and Abraham that they would have a son. Uh, they Years passed, they still didn't have a son, so they uh, logically, they said, okay, this is what we need to do. Hagar was brought in that uh, they had a son, Ishmael, and uh, the, the logical thing was for Sarah to do that. But just because it's logical doesn't mean it's right. So from that, you ended up with two jealous women. We talked about this last week. We read in Genesis 16, 6 that Sarah abused Hagar, which means literally she whipped her. And we, we think about Abraham and Sarah. We don't think about Sarah being that way, do we? I mean, we think about, boy, you got Abraham, you got Sarah, and, but, but she, she just hated Hagar. And because of that, she abused her, and, and you have two jealous women there, and they're, uh, they're living there together. Then you end up with two competing sons, Ishmael. Y'all remember what his name means? God is listening, or God is watching, or God is paying attention. And then uh, you have another son named Isaac. What does his name mean? Laughter. Isaac came, and it, it, it means laughter. So uh, you have a... a a uh, 13-year-old boy that's there, and he's uh, been there. He's been the only son. He's the son of the promise. And, and then uh, here comes Isaac, and the reason he's called laughter was because at 90 years old, Sarah laughed when God said, you know, I'm going to fulfill my promise to you. Because of that, we have two hostile races now, and we talked about all this last week. I'm going to keep saying that. We have the descendants of Ishmael, and they became the, the Arab. Uh, and and they're they're still descendants of the of Ishmael still to this day, and then you had the descendants of Isaac, and they became the Israelites or the Jewish people. They're still here, still to this day. They're still arguing over who's the child of the promise because the the people that came from Ishmael, the Arab people, they're saying we're we're descendants of the promise. We we received the inheritance of the land. They're fighting over Jerusalem, over the Temple Mount, and and the descendants of Isaac says no, we're the we're the promised child. So there's ever since that time there's been two hostile races, and they're going to continue on, folks. I didn't mention this last week. It's it's interesting to me that uh, in the news, I mentioned this a few weeks ago on Wednesday night, uh, in the news, uh, the president signed a deal with, uh, with the Israelites giving them the land of Jerusalem. Now, that, that went unnoticed. That was a big deal. That was a big deal. In the, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time there, but, but uh, Israel had won that in a battle years ago, but they had always allowed the, uh, the, the, uh, the Arabs to come and use that part and, and, and kind of claim it as their own. Well, well, there's a new deal been signed. That, that's something we need to keep an eye on. But, so the Muslims, the uh, radical folks from that part of the country, you may say, well, you know, what, what's the deal with them? Uh, Islam, all of that, those are all descendants of Ishmael. And, and remember what God said about them in Genesis 16, 12. He says, they'll be a wild donkey of a man. Their hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against them. They'll live in hostility towards all of their brothers and their selves and all of the folks there. They're always in, uh, in some kind of turmoil uh, with, uh, with everybody else. And God said that was going to happen. So, so we end up with these two hostile races. Well, there were some lessons there, and I'm moving through this pretty quick. So uh, just as a reminder, the first was this, that Ishmael represents, and, and that's what Paul is doing. you got these false teachers in the church saying we need to live under the law. And Paul has already written, uh, as our Bible's laid out, three chapters on the law versus grace. He continues right here. And, and he says, Ishmael, he, he, is, he was born a slave, and Paul uses the law for that. He was born like a slave to the law. And, and his name, God is watching. God is always paying attention God has got his, his eye on you, and, and a lot of people think that. They think God is, is like a judge sitting on a throne just waiting, to, just waiting to throw down judgment up on you. And, and when we have that, that's frustrating. That's performance-based religion. 
It's based on our performance. Everything, everything we do is, is God's paying attention. I have to perform. God's paying attention. I have to perform. And then you have Isaac, which means name is laughter, which means really we joyfully live under grace. That's what Paul says, that, that when we live through the promise of the promised son that was born of a, of a supernatural way, just like Jesus Christ was reborn supernaturally, then we have a joyful life under grace. I hope you don't miss that, that point. His name, uh, Ishmael, God is watching. On the other hand, Isaac, born supernaturally, that, that we live in the joy of God's grace. Now, the last thing before we get into today's message is, is the problem with the law is it produces pride. We talked about this scripture last week uh, over in uh, Luke chapter 18. We talked about the Pharisee, and he went to the temple, and he prayed. And y'all remember, he, he stood and says, Thank God I'm not like this other man. I, I tithe. I'm a good person. I give. I help the poor. I help the needy. I do all of these things. And, and thank God I'm not like this old beggar over here. And it says there in Luke 18 that, that that person, he bowed down before the Lord and he said, Have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus asked, Which do you think went away justified? We see the difference of that picture of, of Ishmael pride. We see the difference of that one who's, who's saying, I've got to do some things to impress God. And we see this picture of Isaac that simply says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. So today we're going to continue on that Ishmael legalism and Isaac under grace. And we need to realize they can't live in the same tent together. Okay, we don't live in tents, but they lived in tents this more, uh, during this time. So tell your legalistic learnings or your legalistic thoughts that they need to take a hike. Now, now, where do we get that from? So Ishmael and Hagar, they've, they've lived together for 17 years now. That's a long time. For 17 years, they've been living in the same tent. But when, Ish, when Isaac comes along, and, and we looked at this last week, Ishmael starts ridiculing, making fun of him, and he's just three years old at the time. And, and Ishmael still, he's, he's, he's riding him all the time. Hey, I'm the promised son. I was the firstborn son. All of these things. Well, finally, uh, Sarah has all she can take, and she says, you got to kick them out. At that point... Uh, the law and grace, we see the picture that Paul says, they can't coexist to get together. I want you to hear that. Law and grace can't coexist together. You either believe that the things you do make God's happy. You either believe that the things you do make God's happy, or you come like this beggar did, and you just fall on your knees every day and says, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm just a sinner. I'm just a sinner now. If we ask that question, would you rather be under the law or would you rather be under grace? Aren't you glad that God doesn't say, we need to do all these things to make me happy? He simply says this, we, we come to Him and we say, have mercy on me, a sinner. The, the theme song of the legalist is this, Jesus paid its sum, so I must pay the rest. Sin still leaves a crimson stain, so I have to do my best. We don't sing that song, do we? We sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. Not st- sin had left me stained, so I, I have to do my best. And, and when we think about that, we live in the freedom of grace. Isn't that great? I want you to do something. We had a, we had a music director, and I, I, still, I, I still talk to him. I like him. He would sing a song. We'd sing a lot of different songs, and we sing a song, Joy is a flag flown high in the castle of my heart. In the castle of my heart. You ever heard that? And he would make us put our hands up and go, Get your flags up. Y'all remember this? <laughs> Kenneth. Get your flags up, joy is a flag flown high. I hated that. <laughs> you know, I wanted to be sad and frowning on a pew like many of y'all do. Stand up. <laughs> now some of y'all are going, boy, I wish I'd have stayed home today. <laughs> Take a deep breath. You know that does two things. That wakes you up. We talked last week, stay up for a minute. Uh, about the movie, The Titans. Did anybody watch that this week? I did, happened to. 
towards the end of that movie, the Titans win the championship, state championship game. Gary Routier, if I miss any of this up, y'all tell me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> it is too. Their star linebacker, <laughs> who is paralyzed, is in the hospital bed. And the uh, Titans win after a play right at the end of the game. And he holds his hands up and takes a deep breath. Y'all do that one more time. All right, y'all can be seated. Now, why did I do that? <laughs> this week, isn't it something about just just a good fresh breath and a good stretch just to go? Maybe you get up in the morning, it's a new day. Maybe you get on from work, it's a new evening. Maybe you, you're ready for bed, but what would it be like this week if you kicked out every legalistic thought you had? I mean, you throw it aside and you simply say, you know what, I'm going to enjoy the week living in, in God's grace. I mean, I'm going to enjoy the week. I, I may goof up, I may fail, but you know what, when I goof up and when I fail, I'm just going to enjoy the grace of God. I'm going to live this week. I'm going to throw out legalism. I'm going to throw that out of my tent. It can't coexist, and I'm going to live uh, in the love of God's grace. I want to ask you to do that this week. I want you to just, just enjoy the week, take you some deep breaths, and, and uh, when you smush your finger, when someone cuts you off in traffic, when, you, uh, when your ranch slips and, and uh, you, you bust your knuckles, Neil, and, and whatever, just... I threw a fit. I waved a national symbol at the driver. I threw the wrench and dropped a few cuss words, but oh, I'm glad I'm living in God's grace, not under the law. That, that God's not going to say, got you for that. But to say, I'm living in freedom. That's what Paul wanted these Galatians to understand. We live in the freedom of God's grace. Here's the last thing this morning, our, our personal points. Now, don't get too excited because I have three points under the last point. So don't say, man, we're going to be out of here for the Church of Christ and beat them to the, ma- the cafe. But, but here it is. Here are three personal PowerPoints for you. Three ways to apply what we've talked about. Remember this, God always keeps His promises. He always keeps His promises. Sarah and, and Abraham, they uh, 90 years old. We give up. God, is, God made us a promise, but you know what? I, I gave up. But listen, folks, God will always keep His promise. He, he'll never fail. God made us a promise that He said, I, I, I'll give you rest for your weary souls. God's going to give us that promise. He, God made us a promise that He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. God's going to keep that promise. God, God made us a promise that we don't have to worry about what we're going to eat or what we're going to drink or where we're going to stay or what we're going to do tomorrow. He says, I take care of the birds of the field. I take care of the flowers. I take care of all these things. And I promise you, I'm going to take, I'm going to take care of those things. You know what? When we begin to live in God, God's promise. You know what we're doing? We're living in the freedom that God offers. Just to say, God, I'm, I'm free in you. I believe worry is a sin. You know why? Because basically what worry does is worry says, God, you're a liar and I can't believe you. God, what you told me and what your promises were, they, they're really not true. We need, to, we need to stop worrying. We need to bring things to God and we need to pray and, and we need to realize God's going to keep His promise. Now, here's where we fail. This is what happened to Sarah and this is what happened to Abraham. This is my second point. God's not in a hurry. You know, we try to take shortcuts and we live in an instant download culture and, and we want instant gratification and we're always in a hurry. I mean, we're, I, I'm terrible about that. I, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm really impatient with people, with people, 
you know, not myself, but I'm impatient with everybody else because they're not going fast enough. They're not doing exactly what I mean. I mean, we, we like we like things to happen. We like things to be moving. When I was growing up, I, we had a group in the church called the RAs. Y'all remember those? And we were royal ambassadors for Christ. And, and uh, I love fried chicken. I think that's a requirement for preachers, isn't it? You know, you, you, uh, you have to like fried chicken. I was, there was a place in Paris, and uh, it was down on uh, uh, kind of on the south uh, town. It was called Soul Foods. Did any of y'all ever eat there? Oh, it was good, wasn't it? And I was in there one day, and this, these two guys were talking, and that, that one said, man, that woman can fry chicken like a preacher's wife. <laughs> she could, boy, it was good. But I love fried chicken. That's why I entered the ministry. So, you know, uh, uh, we went on a RA trip to Broken Bow Lake, and my dad and a couple of my uncles, they, uh, they were there, and we got an old cast iron black, bean pot, you know, it wasn't a Dutch oven, there's a difference there, and, and uh, they were going to cut up chicken. Girls, did y'all know that chicken comes as a whole chicken, and you can cut it up and make pieces out of that? Y'all may not have known that, but uh, they, uh, they cut up a chicken, and they floured it, and they salt and peppered it, and they put that black pot on the stove, on the, uh, on the campfire, and, and uh, boy, we started frying chicken. There was a bunch of us boys there, and uh, it fried, you know, Crisco, good old, just old Crisco grease. They just get in there, and it's white, and it melts, and, and uh, boy, we were out playing. It smelled good, and it was everywhere around. We run back over there, and is the chicken ready? No, it's not ready yet. Four or five times, is it ready to eat yet? No, it's not ready to eat yet. Well, finally, after like 12 or 14 hours, they said, okay, it's ready. <laughs> cut into it. Oh, no, it's not ready either. I don't know why it took so long, but uh, literally, I'm not exaggerating. I think it was midnight before we ate any chicken. Half the guys had gone to bed, you know, because I, I would imagine the campfire wasn't hot enough to get the grease hot enough to do anything, but just let it sit there and bubble. And, and uh, you know, after folks had finally, we finally got some good chicken. Boy, it was perfect. It tasted so good. I can still taste it. And that was that was 50 years ago, you know, but, but finally we got to eat. We're just not patient like that anymore, are we? I mean, we would have we'd have dumped that out and got a can of Vainies and said, no chicken tonight. You know, we got something right here, and, and, and we're, we're just always in a hurry. We want God to do things now. We're, we're like that person that said, God, I, give me patience, and I want them right now. I mean, we, we want things right now. And, and I, I want to remind you, don't give up on God. He, he's not in a hurry, but His timing is always impeccable. It's always perfect. God's timing is not our timing, but, but we need to keep on praying. We need to keep on trusting, and we need to realize that God's timetable is not our timetable, and God's not in a hurry, but He has a plan for us. Now, here's the last thing. When, when I replace God's plan with my plan, see, that's what Abraham and Sarah did. They, they, they said, well, wait a minute. Now, God, you're not moving fast enough for us, so, so we're going to replace your plan with our own plan. When we do those things... There, there's always consequences of that mistake. They're usually negative. There, there's always negative uh, consequences. We, we called that the Hagar solution last week, and, and it, that's where it gets dangerous when we believe that God helps those who help themselves. Remember we talked about that? That's not in the Bible, incidentally. It's dangerous when we, when we start living by that. You know, God will help me, but I've got to help myself. God help those who help myself. Here's what God's Word says in Jeremiah 29, 11. His plan is to help you and give you a hope for the future. That's God's plan. And He has a plan for you, and He has a plan for me. And, and in His perfect timing, His plan is going gonna, gonna to be exactly where it needs to be at the exact time it needs to be. Remember, we're talking about we need to believe in God's promise. Not only do we need to believe in God's promise, we need to realize that God's not in a hurry. And, and there's a guy named uh, Paul Anger. Has anybody all heard of him? Okay. You just tell me what this song is. I'm going to stop before the chorus. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, he has not. To say things he truly feels and not the words 
of He Who Kneels. Does anybody recognize that song? Got a guess right here. What is it? My way. There you go, right there. Here's the chorus. Let the record show that I took the blows and I did it my way. Now, you might say, oh yeah, I know that song. That's a pretty good song. No, listen to what it says. For what is a man and what has he got? If not himself, he has not. To say the things he truly feels, but not the words of those who kneel. The record shows that I took the blows and I did it my way. You know, anytime we, we come to that ideal of saying, you know what, I'm going to do it my way. Let the record show that not like those who kneel, but, but I did it the way I wanted to do it. I, I spoke freely the way I wanted to do it. You know, there's people that actually have that song played at, at their funeral because they've intentionally rejected faith in Jesus Christ. The, the family says, oh, that would be, that'll be a fitting end. He did it his way. Boy, he, he, he went out just like he wanted to. He, she went out just like she wanted to. She, she did it her way. He did it his way. Nearly a, 120 years ago, the, the Titanic sank. It's been a nearly 120 years. It likes a year or so, I think. Before it sailed, people thought it was unsinkable, Right? April the, the 14th uh, is when it sailed, it, it, it started sinking, I mean, on, on the 14th. It went down on uh, the early hours of August the 15th in 1912. Uh, people said it was unsinkable. Y'all remember that? It was the unsinkable ship because it had a double hull with 16 watertight compartments. So double hull watertight compartments. This one could fill with water, but it, it had 15 more, you know, so it was just, it was just unsinkable. For a lot of years, experts said, well, this, uh, this iceberg that they hit uh, tore a 300-foot gash down the side of this 900-foot long ship. That's what the experts used to say. Incidentally, y'all remember the quote was that even God couldn't sink the, the Titanic. Since then, the ship, y'all, there's all kinds of shows on the Titanic you can watch, you know, documentaries. But they've gone in, they photographed uh, their, uh, these submergibles gone down, and they photographed the wreckage, and they've looked at all of these different things. They've used sonar. They discovered that uh, there's only six small slits in the side of that ship. Just six small gashes were torn into the hull. But these six small rips were six of the watertight compartments that, that were ripped into. And, of course, water gushed into the ship, and, and it was, they were on the front of the ship, and the ship started to sink. And if you've seen the ship, you know, you, I mean, you've seen the movie, you know the, the top starts to sink and only Hollywood fashion, how it stands up and breaks in two, which it actually did break in two. But to think about these little things and these large consequences that it caused. I mean, six, just six small gashes. That night, 1,522 people lost their lives. I would say Abraham and Sarah probably didn't think it was no big deal to father a child through Hagar, but those consequences have been colossal. Still, still to this day, uh, 4,000 years later, people are still suffering because of that decision. On the Titanic, there was a lot of famous people. You've probably recognized, I think, Jacob, John Jacob Asher. He was the unsinkable Molly Brown. If you've seen the movie, you know the kind of the mainline story, which there's several movies out there. But there's one hero that Hollywood never has mentioned. Uh, on board the Titanic that day was a Baptist preacher. He was from Scotland. His name was John Harper. He was 39 years old. He and his daughter, six-year-old daughter, Nina, they were traveling to America for John to preach at the Moody Church in Chicago. John's wife had died a few years before, so it was just he and his daughter. He was raising his daughter. He was a single dad. Here's the story. As the ship was sinking, John placed Nina in a lifeboat but made no effort to follow her. Instead, he turned, he ran through the sinking ship yelling, Women, 
children and unsaved get in the lifeboats. He continued to pass through the crowd imploring people to place their faith in Jesus Christ. He gave a life jacket to a man who said he wasn't a Christian. And John said, here you go. You're going to need this more than I do. As the ship sank below the surface, the water filled uh, the, below the surface, the water was filled with people clinging to different pieces of debris. Of those hundreds of people floating in icy water, only six were rescued. One of them was a man who met John Harper in the water. It says four years later, after the Titanic sank, the man shared his testimony at a church in Hamilton, Canada. He said this, I'm a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on a spar that awful night, the tide brought John Harper by on a piece of wreckage near me. Man, he said, are you saved? No, I said, I am not. And he replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you should be saved. The waves bore him away, but brought him back a little bit later. Again, he said, are you saved now? No, I said, I certainly or I cannot honestly say that I am. He said again, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. He said a short time later, he went down. And there alone in the night with two miles of water underneath me, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. Now that's from Moody Adams. That was a writing about heroes of the Testament. If you ever go to, to Scotland, which I don't think I'll ever go, but in Glasgow, Scotland, there's a, there's a Harper Memorial Baptist Church named after John Harper, the pastor. They never recovered his body, uh, but the church made a tombstone that on his tomb is inscribed, Greater love hath no man than this then he would lay down his life for a friend. Paul, he looked at the church at, at Galatia, and he said this, now who's your mama? Not who's your daddy. And if your spiritual mama is Hagar, then you're a bondage to religion. You're, you're bound in, in religion. You're a bondage to religion. In other words, you have to do something to be saved. But if your spiritual mama is, is Sarah, then you've been set free by God's grace. And, and when we're set free, the, the, the Bible says who, who God sets free, we're free indeed. We've been set free by the grace of God. If you're hanging on to a piece of wood and you're, you're facing death, you don't know where you're going, you know what? You can believe. The, the tragic news is this. After the, 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 the news of the Titanic reached both shores, of course, there were people everywhere wondering about their loved ones. There was, you know, 1,528 people aboard and, and uh, people was thinking, where does their loved ones at? What was faced? A few days later, every major newspaper in the United States and England published names of the passengers. And on that list, there was two columns. The two columns said this, one was saved and the other was lost. People looked, saved or lost. I want to ask you to bow your heads. And the Bible says this, when Christ comes again, or when we, when we die, if we die before Christ returns, that there's a Lamb's book of life. And in that book, God says this, Blessed are those whose name are written in the Lamb's book of life, saved. But those whose names are not found there are lost for all eternity. Saved or lost, there's no middle ground. Now, I think what turns people off of, and I'm going to use this term, religion, is this. You know, I can't live a bunch of do's and a bunch of don'ts, and I can't live this life. Here's the thing. God says, if you come to me just as you are, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then God will begin to change the areas that we need to change, not as a to-do list, but that we would be more like Him. If you're hanging a, on a piece of, of wood in freezing water, then think about the words of John Harper. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be saved.
Father, I pray this morning that we truly would understand what it is not to live in the bondage of religion, but, Father, we'd live in the freedom of your grace. We could stretch our arms and take a deep breath and just say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and live as free men and free women in your grace. Lord, I pray this week, every time that thought enters our mind, I pray that we would take that deep breath and just praise you for the love and the grace that we live in. Father, I also pray that those areas of our lives that we've kind of wrapped up and we've just got a little pockets of legalism here and there, I pray, Lord, that those might be revealed to us. We've already seen over the past weeks what, what legalism does, how it drives us from your truth and drives us from the cross. And, Father, I pray that we would surrender our all to you, we would live in the freedom of you, and most of all, we'd live in the joy of serving you, a risen Savior. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.